Yeah, so let's see uh let's see this table. Can you so, see it? So Micah started doing this, you know, before his um news of his baby. He knew his, his wife was pregnant, so he was doing a personal search. This is completely okay to do. This is not taking a shot in the dark, in other words, looking for something that we don't know anything about. Michael knows his family and knows his situation. So these terms are easily searched. Okay, so um, the search term was Spiffy. Um, that's the nickname that I've had since high school. Um, then when I got with my wife, her nickname was Iffy. And on here, that's like a Yod. What's that? Pay? Yod? Right there. Um, so here's Spiffy. And then here's Iffy. And then my daughter's name, Sire, was in there too. But this isn't the table with her in it. it it's in here somewhere. But um, right here, uh, Yod, what's that, Bob, Samoth Pay, is that what that is? Um, that's Joseph, or Yosef. And then here it is again, run into this date. And the date is uh, 2019, 2020. Um, so he's due, um, in 2019, um, May, May 10th or something like that. But, um, my daughter, Sari was in here somewhere. I have several tables saved, uh, well, several spots saved to this, uh, matrix. That you, know, I have. you got right up under, and, and sorry to interrupt, but I was just looking right up under Yosef and right next to Spiffy, uh, right there, yeah, you've got Abat, uh, which is a verb of Abat or Abati. Those are all variations of father. So Abati, Aleph Bet Tav Yod, connecting with the Yod in your name, that's my father. So you got Joseph right above his name or, or, or uh, this statement, which is your son. And right wow. next, right under that, same four letters, right under those four letters, you've got my father. So the, the code is saying Spiffy, my father, Joseph. Wow. That's, that's a pretty amazing uh, conjunction of, of terms yeah. right there uh, that seem to have relevance, right? You are yeah. his father. And this is before he's even born. It's amazing. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, um, put that up there, you know, just, you know, so people, you know, won't know that it's a fraud. You and know? then you said, and then you said your wife's nickname was Iffy, Yod, Pay, Yod? Yeah. It was um, sharing the pay in your name, too. Yeah. Or, yeah. or, or or in the, or in your baby's name, so that that's, that's pretty connection cool. to both. Yeah, and uh, one of the other tables, I got like ten of them saved on this, where I went different directions, um, because the wilderness is on the other side of this table, and it has a date and everything. So it's kind of trying to keep things separate, so I wouldn't get lost in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's testimony and that's why, th this is why I, you know, I joined really because, you know, I had this done before I joined when I, dad left his laptop here and I got on his program. Yeah. And you know, incredible details that, especially if you, if you're searching things that like your name, Spiffy, um, is a unique uh, name to you. Nicknames are very good to search because um, if you can get the nickname and the proper name in the same table, we're talking about a specific person now. Because in, in all of the world, how many Micahs are there? 
in all of the world. How many Jonathan Wrights are there, right? But if you can get a nickname or something that, that narrows that down or, or specifies a person, um, that's good. The only reason I knew this table uh, was about us is because it had my nickname, my wife's, and then my daughter, Syri. You know, I mean, there's no mistake in that. Good deal. Did you, was you That's gonna, awesome. Uh, there was another one you wanted to share? Oh, me? Yeah. Are you done? Uh, yeah, I, I'm done. Okay. All right. Anybody else got a code? What they're working on? Small class today. Uh, I've got one that I'm, it's kind of incomplete, but I'm working on it right now if you guys want to see. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm doing codes right now. I'm trying to, to code out uh, concepts involving the 144,000. Um, different variations, uh, skip sequences, words, uh, plain text, co uh, EDLS, anything. And uh, I think I've got something kind of interesting here. Let me share my screen. All right, the, the axis term, this word here, uh, you'll find it in Nehemiah. Um, the one's being sealed. The axis term doesn't have the hay, it has a calf in set instead. So it would be as the one's being sealed. Okay. So drop the hay and put a calf there. And that's what I have right here. Calf, chet, tau, vav, mem, yod, mem as the ones being sealed. And this right here in the pink is the Shema on Deuteronomy 6.4. Shema Yasharel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, okay? Right below it is, uh, let's see, Deuteronomy 6.8. This is really what jumped out at me. You shall bind them for a sign upon thy head, and they shall be as frontlets between the eyes. So you have the seal on the forehead right there. Right here, sharing the vav and the axis term, going this way. And then uh, this right here is uh, I and Mem Summit. Uh, Gimel, Lamed, Hey, that's chosen people. Wow. At a skip of 144. Oh, wow. That's really cool. And that's so far, um, it's what I've got. And I, you know, I didn't want to show it yet because, you know, it's, it's easy to just, you know, well, I'm going to show this table and then, you know, stop working on it. And, I, and if I uh, find anything else, hopefully I'll, I'll, there's some more in I'm sure there's, there's some really good terms in here. I mean, that right there is enough uh, for, for me to, to, uh, to be satisfied with and, and, and knowing that this is talking about the, the 144,000. There's no doubt to me. Um, I was sure I would like to find more terms. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to show this table again in, in another class where, um, but I like the proximity here with this and the plain text and, and the, the relevant um, scripture. Right. Um, so, and, and the skip number too. <laughs> I mean, you can't. So yeah. that, uh, 144,000, those are alive at the time that they receive the mark or the seal. Well, um, I think in Revelation, and Brother Jonathan could probably clarify, they're, they're the, the first fruits of the resurrection, are they not? 
first, I would think the first fruits of the resurrection is those, those that died um, before the, okay. the crucifixion. And when Yeshua, when, when Yeshua went into Sheol and led mm. the captives free, uh, those that were in Abraham's bosom, um, Abraham, um, Moses, David, all of those that were in the, in the place separating from Sheol, right? Because they were not allowed to go into heaven. Incidentally, uh, extra, extra biblical books and writings and uh, state, even, even historically, um, with, with like Josephus, at that time, there were those that came out of the grave with Yeshua. Uh, and we're walking around uh, until he went back home. I believe they they also were allowed to go. Some would say, well, you know, if man is only appointed to die once, then how come um, Lazarus had to die twice? There's nothing in the scriptures that tell us that Lazarus died twice. Right. He, he, he rose up um, from the dead. It is only required of him to die once, right? Only once. So it it's, leaves you to, to uh, you know, with this conundrum. What happened to um, Lazarus? Well, what happened to all the rest of them? Even though we're not told, I don't believe that they come out of the grave and then, then live another life and then died again. That goes against what the scripture says, that, that all are, are appointed once to die. Um, and that is a physical flesh death. There is a second death. For those that qualify for that, where your your spirit, your soul is destroyed in 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 the fire, so um, I, I've kind of believed that that is the the, the first fruits uh, of the resurrection, and those that are sealed in the end time for a particular purpose. And I think there are others that are sealed as well. And we see this in um, Ezekiel, where the the man in the white with the inkhorn at his side go is yeah. commanded to go. And um, mark those that, that are not going to be affected by pestilence, war, and, and all of those kind of things it's for a purpose. Um, many believe that that is the 144,000. And incidentally, in the English, in English translation of a Greek text, we are to believe that these are 144,000 male virgins, right? But when I watched Ariel Cohen talking about this concept, um, he, he, he emphatically states that there is no concept of virginity in Judaism because we're all a spark. We're all a spirit. So the way he interpreted that, he looked at it, and, I, and it clicked with me when he said that, is that these are spiritual because the word's not bathula that's used, virgin. The word there is um, um, alma. I keep thinking it's a met, but it's not. It's alma which is basically a maiden, um, which can be a virgin that's um, is, is a pure female um, betrothed to, to the Messiah. They are maidens at first. And then this kind of concept, Ariel Cohen believes that these spiritual beings, these children, and he thinks that they could be literal children, maybe my children, maybe your children, that come up, that have a particular purpose in the end days they're undefiled by what by the come out of her my people stuff these are these are first generation or second generation christian folk that come out of christianity and back into torah he interprets it like that that they're virgins of the torah they don't have any uh Longevity in this, and not been in the tour. They, they weren't even taught that. They were taught the New Testament, right? So, um, and this is coming from an Orthodox Jew that is putting these pieces together and say, "Wait a minute, no, 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 no. This, these are people that are virgins from the Torah, and they're coming out." When you see, and he's talking about Revelation when he says, "Come out of her, my people," he's talking about the religion that we're in, or whatever practice that we're in, and, and going to the original. I hmm. think that's a, a more accurate portrayal of, of this virgin concept, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean sexually virgins, right? Because there's no, there's no procreation. There's no, um, no, no sexual activity in this uh, function that they are a part of. It is a spiritual function. So it is more than likely talking about their spiritual condition um, rather than their physical sexual uh, state. 
if that makes any sense. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, yeah. and so we're, we're talking about a Greek text that is written about Hebraic people interpreted into English. A lot is lost. A lot is lost in that. Um, so I find that really interesting uh, concept because I thought about that before. How is this possible? What are we talking about here? We're talking about little children, uh, little boys that are, that are physically never been intimate with a woman kind of thing. And uh, listening to him, he's like, that is a very bizarre concept. That is not something that's Hebraic as far as sexuality is concerned because we're all, he states that we're all a, a spark. In other words, in, in, in Judaism, your life force or your spirit is called a spark or like a flame, a light, in other words. That definitely clears that up for me, because that's what I was thinking. It was, it was sexual, it was intimate. So that actually, that makes a lot more sense to me now. I'll get that video that uh, he, he actually goes in depth on a lot of stuff in Revelation about like the two witnesses and, and gives you a perspective that's unique uh, in the sense that we've, we've been taught from a Christian perspective, what the Christian uh, ide ideology about it, or right. ideas about it is uh, instead of uh, you know looking at it with the hebraic perspective um there's a lot to it when you look at it that way there's something lost when you when you run it through translations and things like that it, it dilutes it it, it uh, erodes the really the real in-depth meaning of what's going on uh, yeah. from John. yes hey what was that now was he uh talking about an Aramaic uh, or, um, translation was that coming from an Aramaic or a, or a Hebrew translation, or was he, or was that from the Greek? No, I don't think he was reading the Greek. I think he was he was he was consuming Revelation from a Hebrew perspective. So he's probably looking at it in the Aramaic or in the modern Hebrew because Revelation, guys, there are um, Messianic Jews who need the New Testament, and so there are there are books that are you know, at their disposal that are in English for modern day. So that, so right. they don't have an English translation of the, of the Brit the shot. It's in their language. Right. So looking right. at it in that kind of language, the from the first century. again, and she's pointing out the Peshitta from the first century. This is something they would have had access to and always had access to. Right? It's not lost. Right. It's not something new that just been sprung on these Jewish people. They've always had access to, to these writings, um, right? So I think it's... They just make you believe that, huh? Right. They make you believe it. Because Christianity, through the, the efforts of the Catholic Church originally, they wanted to whitewash and remove anything Judaism. Anything. You, to, today, in modern, uh, modern times, you'll hear those that come against the Hebrew roots movement using terminology like those Judaizers, Right. You don't want to be around those Judaizers like we're trying to turn you into a Jew. It's not that at all. We're trying to I get that a lot. <laughs> you are Hebrew, that you are part of those tribes that, that are supposedly lost. Not at all. He knows exactly where you are. His promise was to gather you again in the end times. So um, it's about a restoration to, to the original, not uh, in any of the other nonsense. And I believe that's what he says. Come out for my people is not talking about a geographical location specifically. It may be in a sense, right? Common sense tells me, well, I live in a nation that's wicked. Maybe I need to move or something, but the brass tacks of it is come out of my, my people is talking about religion. That woman that's riding a beast who perverts men with the drunkenness from her cup. This is religion. This is, right. this is, all of it, the Pentecostals, the, the Protestants, the Catholics, all of it has been, has been painted from what the original was. There's no getting around that. Guys, there is no festival called Christmas for Christians. That is inserted by the paganistic teachings. It, it was to divert you from those festivals that actually mean something. His, and Jeremiah 10 will tell you that. Yeah. If you read Jeremiah 10, 5, it tells you do not cut a tree down, bring it into your house. Do not decorate it with gold and silver like the heathens do. Why? Because in ancient times, that's exactly what the, the pagans were doing. They were taking these, it was a part of a tradition. Well, fast forward several 
uh, hundreds of years and through the Catholic church, what do they want to do? Well, we want to be inclusive with the heathen. So we'll, this is what we'll do. We'll blend, we'll blend everything and make them feel like they're part of it. And that's exactly what happened. There's, there's no, you know, you know, beating around the bush on this. That's exactly what they did and why they did it was to bring those heathens in. It doesn't make it right. and doesn't make it holy at all just because a church did that. It makes it perverted. And I think it's very clear from you his writing or his scriptures that he's not happy with that. When the scripture says, I don't like your feasts in your, your festivals, he is not talking about his Moedim. Some Christians will throw that back in your face and say, look, he says right here, you don't like your feast and your, 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 uh, your, your traditions and all this stuff. He's telling you he don't like these feasts. Why are you keeping the feast? And it's simple. He's not talking about his feast person. He's talking about your feast, the ones that you decided to keep and not his. Right? Why would he about his talk to and It's not contradicting himself. Some will say he's contradicting himself. One place he says, these are my feasts and these are my ordinance. You'll keep them all of your generation. But in, out of the other side of his mouth, he's supposedly saying, I hate your feast. The key word is your feast. He didn't right. say, I hate my feast. Yeah, but that's because they're taking it out of context. Their eyes aren't open to the scriptures. Exactly. They're not studying their Bible. <laughs> exactly. They'll take pits and pieces of scripture and, and twist it into what they want it to say. See, we're not supposed to keep the feast. He says, I hate your feast. No, he's saying he hates your feast, not his feast. He hates Christmas. He hates Easter. He hates Valentine's Day. He hates all those things that you are keeping, fervently keeping, with no, no thought of him at all. That's what he hates. As my good friend Joe would say, they cherry-picked their verses. Very and that's exactly what it is. They're cherry-picking verses and putting it together to prove their point. You're absolutely right. You guys can, can I say across the board with, with uh, doctrines, uh, those that want to harp only on, you're supposed to be rich. You, Jesus wants you to be wealthy. That's his. He didn't come and, and die on the cross so you could be poor. I'm hearing this from this freaking disgusting prophet. Uh, gosh, what's his name? It's a black guy. He's going all over Facebook. Creflo Dollar. Not Creflo. This is a young no. kid. I know who you're talking about. I did a I did a video on him. Joe's uh, what was that black guy on? Um, that Joseph? No. No, it wasn't Prophet Joseph. Prophet. Uh, he's got oh, really pretty eyes. He's I mean he's got he's got blue eyes. The black. Yeah, guy. he's like Haitian. He's got greenish brown eyes, like stunning eyes. Very, I mean, very That's beautiful why he eyes. Gets women that he gets, why he very good point. I, I heard your wife there. It's a very good point. Most yeah. of his followings are young black girls. Yes. 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 Black uh, girls. And they're all over Facebook attention. saying he's our prop. He's our Jesus. Jesus has returned. Right. Oh my gosh. But if you look at his videos, he's got videos where, the, where his ex-girlfriend's coming in, cussing out a storm. He's Joshua talking. Holmes. Joshua Holmes. Joshua. That's his name. Yes. Joshua Holmes is the he's talking about sexual intercourse and sucking on a wang. And I mean, like it's nasty stuff. Something, a, you know, prophet shouldn't talk about. The, what the guy has done is he has taken things from Benny Hinn and Thank run you, with it in the black community. Like the, the whole, you know, taking his jacket and sweeping it toward the crowd to, throw the Holy Spirit on them, right? And the whole crowd just falls over. I would have you to know that's not the Holy Spirit, folks. That are people participating in what's called Kundalini. It's his wickedness. This is not the Holy Spirit. There's that's nobody the getting Spirit, right? saved and, and healed in this guy's productions. Not one. It's all a sham. And it's sad because we're told in the scriptures that just people are going to come out the woodworks in the end times, cashing in. On the, on the naive people in the end times who, who just want some miracle. They want to see their family safe. They want to be healed of cancer. So what do they do? They see all these people falling down and getting supposedly getting healed, right? Well, I must need to send him my money and get healed because that's what he tells them. You don't that get it from the Sow to the prophet of the Lord. You better sow to the prophet of the Lord. You expect, he tells them, you expect a miracle and you're holding on your money? You need to sow your money into this ministry if you want God to bless you. He says that. He says yeah. that to people. And then he'll have these young black females come on behind him and say, oh, Joshua is the Jesus now. He's the new Jesus. He's the, he's the new Jesus that's come. 
Oh my gosh. And Wouldn't that be a familiar spirit? It makes me physically feel sick. Yeah. When I see, I cannot watch it. It turns, I feel this depression come over me and this righteous anger, depression for those that are following this and that are, that are, they're so convinced that this guy's genuine. I feel sick to my stomach because how do you reach him? How do you get to him? And I, and I feel compelled that I want to do something in, in, but in some cases you can't, they are so blinded and so bewitched that you are an enemy. If you speak against it, they will say, rebuke you, Satan. You don't come against the prophet of God and all this kind of stuff. And you just have to walk away and say, father, I pray for them. I ask that you open their eyes, but this is, this is a strong demon that's got these people. Um, and it's a religious spirit. Same one that's running through Benny Hinn, same run running through Paula and all of them that are on TV now telling you, you know, Kenneth Copeland telling you he needs another jet or Jesse Duplantis telling you he needs another jet to make it more efficient so he can get you, you know, to, to, conferences and whatever he's got to go to more efficiently. My gosh, our Messiah came walking into Jerusalem riding a donkey very humbly. Nowhere in the scriptures does he ordain or authorize that pastors and preachers of the end time be rich, rich and filthy rich billionaires. Kenneth Copeland is a billionaire guys. And he measures his, his blessing and his success by the amount of money he's got. That is, he worships mammon. I know he says Jesus and Jesus Christ and all this kind of stuff, and it sounds good. But when you get down to it, it is mammon. It is Doesn't mammon. the scriptures say go sell all your things? Yeah. Or go give all your things away or something like that? There's, there's, there's a difference between blessing and the Father saying, you will be blessed and the rain will come and your flocks will increase and your ground will give, give its fruit and your trees will bear fruit and your children will be healthy and you will be healthy. And these are all of the promises of prosperity. I mean, blessing. Blessing is not that, you know, you've got some people that are donating $10 million and you can build another building and you get in another plane and, and, and the Rolls Royces are outside. That is not the blessings that he's talking about, folks. This is Satan's blessings. This is Satan's way of saying, well done, my child. Good job deceiving, stroking that back. You good, good pastors. Very good. Good, good job. Don't talk about Jesus. Let's talk about your best life now. Tell them they can have their best life now. And I'm not making that up, guys. That is a book by a famous pastor. Your best life now. Yep. Okay. So what, what is heaven? If, if your best life is right now, then, then heaven must be a step down. Second rate. Right? Something's not right with this teaching. And p millions of people are, but my ex-wife follows Joel Osteen religiously. Like he is the one with the message. And it's all because he does not confront their sin. He does not address it at all. We don't talk about that. We're going to talk about the good things. We're going to talk about the positive things. We're going to give all positive vibes, right? Yeah. We're not going to talk about their sinners. Anytime you see a pastor say, we're not going to be talking about Satan. We're not going to talk about that. They're hiding something. They don't I want call to that cotton that. candy, fluffy, puffy Christianity. That's exactly what it is. It'll get you into trouble. Um, compromise. Folks, is, the scriptures are very clear. He is... Our father is not a changing Elohim. He doesn't change from one day to the other. He, it, scripture says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Amen. it tells you that God is doing a new thing, right? He's doing a new thing on earth. And I see this now all over with the new agers. God is doing a new thing. Mm -mm. My scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he's done before, he'll do again. He has not changed. We have changed. My scripture says that if anybody comes teaching you other than what's in this book, that it's not right. Yeah. Yeah. And now, now then when we're talking about Paul preaching a new, another gospel, 
the word gospel is the good news. What is the good news? What is the good news that Paul was talking about and the disciples were talking about? Well, if you go and look, they're citing what the prophets said about the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah is the good news, right? And so the gospel is the Messiah has come. He is here. That is the good news. What the prophet said has come true. That's the good news. That's Amen. the gospel, right? The gospel is not about, in a sense, all about, you know, the saving grace of Jesus and all this kind of stuff. That's in there. That is not exclusively what it is, right? The good news is all of what the prophets had been saying for over a thousand years has been coming true through Yeshua. And the fact that there are some over 400 messianic prophecies, specifically speaking about a person who is a divine representation of the Father. He's coming in the Father's name, relinquishing his this divine power to be a human being, to bleed. And to believe for you, like that's the good news, the gospel. But we cannot take away from it. It comes from the Torah and the prophets. What was written in in there? So when you see Paul saying, you know, he's quoting he's quoting Hosea when he says, "A people who were not my people are now my people." In the place where I said, "Those people who are not my people are now my people." And Paul says this. He's quoting. Hosea, <laughs> Peter does the same thing. They quote Hosea, they quote Amos, they quote Isaiah, they quote Jeremiah in their writings. So that is telling you a big piece of, of, of information there. The, the answers are held in what the prophet said. And so when you start going through and seeing all those prophecies that have been fulfilled through Yeshua, and you look at the, the numbers mathematically what the probability of any one person fulfilling these prophecies for instance you heard me talk about yeshua riding in on a donkey i mean that's actually a, a prophecy guys hosanna hosanna right that, that the messiah the prophecy is that the messiah would would come riding on a donkey and the, zechariah right and the people will be laying down palm fronds and saying hosanna hosanna that happened exactly like the prophets wrote. And standing in the aisles watching this, like this, was the high priest and, and the uh, Pharisees. You know, while they were watching like this, with, with anger in their heart, they're watching Yeshua come in, riding on this donkey. And they're going, What's the nerve of this guy. The nerve of this guy. He's going to insert himself in what Zechariah says. They were, they were seeing a self-fulfilled, they thought self-fulfilling. That this Messiah figure was setting himself up by fulfilling his prophecies. Some believed, Nicodemus believed. This is why Nicodemus, one of these Pharisees, believed that Yeshua is the, was the Messiah. And that's why he came to him. At least two or three of these Pharisees, Joseph of Arimathea is one. They believed that Yeshua is and was the Messiah. And there were the others that wanted to, you know, crucify him. And this is the part of the plan. Some even believe that, that um, Caiaphas knew that Yeshua was the, and knew that he had to do what he did to fulfill the prophecies about this person, that he had to die. He had to be betrayed. He had to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. All of it's prophetic. All of it is prophetic. Joseph was what? Joseph was sold. Remember we were talking about Joseph, a picture of our Messiah? He was sold for 30 pieces of silver by his brothers. Yeshua was sold by his brother for 30 pieces of silver. It's the same thing. He fulfills, I mean, and, and, the, and the probability of one person fulfilling these Messianic prophecies are so astronomical, it's impossible. It, it can only be that Yeshua is the one. When you're looking at the at the numbers and the and the probability of any one person doing this, it's staggering. There's no way that this is an accident or this guy was self-fulfilling prophecies. And even some Orthodox Jews today will say, "Oh, 
oh Yeshua, he was trying to set himself up. He knew that he knew what the scripture said, and he was trying to set, he was trying to self-fulfill this, in other words. Right? I I, I doubt that. I doubt that was his intention. I knew, I know from reading that he was on a schedule. He says this over and over again. The first, you know, at the wedding, when it first comes on the scene, his mother asked him to do a miracle. And he says, mother, my time is not yet. What am I going to do with you? And then he, what she says, whatever he says, you just do it. She had confidence that, you know, let's, let's get this miracle thing going, Yeshua. It's time. Let everybody know who you are. And it's at this wedding that he, she does this. Well, his, his comments are very peculiar. He says, what am I going to do with you, woman? It's not yet my time. What does he mean by that? He's on a time schedule, a linear time set schedule, right? And you see this over and over in the scriptures. Like when he goes to Jerusalem and goes to the temple and, and he's in, infuriated the Pharisees, they want to kill him at that moment. And they have to withdraw Yeshua out of Jerusalem because why? It's not yet his time. You see this over and over again where this, this concept of my time is not yet or my time is short. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's praying, he asks his disciples, please pray with me some more. My time is growing short, right? His time was running out. He knew what was coming on this time schedule. And even now, even now, he's on a time schedule. Those, those fulfilling uh, feasts for, that are going to be fulfilled in his second coming is a part of a timeline that is specific in its moedim. It's appointed, right? When, so when we hear no man knows the day or the hour, that guys, that is an idiom. It's a Hebrew idiom. Let's get this straight. Those Jews that are standing around when they asked him, what are the signs of the, of the end? What's the sign of your coming? And, and toward the end, he's saying, no man knows the day or the hour. No, not even the sun, not even the, the angels in heaven. What he's telling you something there is very deep. He's telling you something about a Moedim. This particular time frame he's talking about can be found the day that no man knows. is a common Hebrew statement referring to trumpets or Yom Turah. If you, if you went into a synagogue today and say, what's the day that no man knows? The first answer you're going to get is Yom Turah because it has to go on the sighting of the moon. The day is not known because you have to sight the sliver of the moon before you can count the day. So understanding that Jewish idiom, it makes sense in this bridegroom concept. Only the father knows, right? Well, the son has access to the father. Does the son not have the right to say, Father, is it time yet? Right? So, so you know, saying that even though Yeshua says that even, you know, the son of man don't know the day. He's talking about the bridegroom concept. But the father is the one who's telling us what to do. It's, it's, it's his instruction. Right? And when the son is going to build your dwelling, it's an addition to the father's house. He's adding on. And in Judaism... In ancient times, when a young boy got married, he built onto his father's house. The father helped him. The father was the one that says, okay, son, now your house is done. Go get your bride. Everything's ready. Right? The son knows the, the process of building his house. He knows when the job is almost complete. And I'm thinking in, in literal construction uh, uh, precepts building something like if you've ever worked in concrete or are building a building you, you get used to the process of what what to do you know when the job is almost done right when the inspector comes off and he's starting to check off everything yeah the doors are right and the windows are sealed good and you don't have any water leaks over here he's going down the checklist this is cross the board in building inspectors do this construction father's doing the same thing it's like okay you got the mansions for the 144,000 over there and you got mansions for these and everything's done. That's how I envision it. But in the process, I'm, I'm thinking Yeshua is very aware of the time frame. He's not in the dark, so to speak. I mean, we're talking about a divine being. He's a son of the most high. He is not in the dark. What the father knows, the son knows. 
So we have to get around this hang up of the sun don't even know, the angels don't know. Well, if you understand that's an idiom, he is not speaking literally, the sun don't know. Now, some people might get upset when they hear that. Go, that goes against scripture. He tells you he don't know that. Well, I know he does. But you have to take these scriptures and understand the, the, the concepts of where it's coming from. If you over angle, 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 Anglo Saxonize these scriptures, you lose a lot. You'll start taking things literal when he's trying to give you an idiom, right? And that's how I see that. Um, only when we go back to the original language that we can begin to understand the concepts and the, and the precepts that were given there uh, in these scriptures. I did not mean to go off on a tangent preaching, guys. I'm sorry. Um, has anybody got anything to add or any codes we, we want to talk about? I do have something to add. Yep. I, no I noticed Harold uh, changed his name again. <laughs> Harold or who? Yeah, that's me. Harold or Harold or what's that movie? Um, Horton Hears a Who? Horton Hears a Who? You ever seen that movie? No. <laughs> it's a dark <laughs> movie. Anyway. I had a question for uh, Darla. Um, does she have like a list of those words that we um, that the English use a lot, like G O O D and G O D, uh, like that we could get to and research? Did you understand what he's asking? Yeah, I, I understand. I just had a moment. To, I'm working with a left hand guy, so it's really difficult. Um, anyway, I had to open my mic. Uh, I haven't made up such a list other than the list that you guys get in your modules, um, week by week or module by module. However, Haruak Eliyahu's channel, they lay out all the pagan terms and all the original terms or what the original terms meant. For instance, the word we know as Barak originally meant, and this is in the Kleins, the Red Dictionary that Eric Bissell uses. Um, it is the etymological dictionary of the Hebrew language. It will tell us that the word Barak originally meant to strengthen. And so that is the definition we should work with is what its purest, most original meaning was, is to strengthen. His name was in number six, 22 to 27. His name was to be put on uh, the children of Yashorel so that they would be strengthened. Um, the word to bless has a pagan meaning and it had to do with blooding a person or cutting them and bleeding them. Um, it's very pagan worship idea. And it's very, obviously it's very ingrained in our Christian background. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, we know God bless you, God bless you. You know, there's a pagan deity and there's a pagan uh, ritual. So it's really important to come out of those those words uh, for the for the person that is seeking to walk up a, a pure walk and to have a pure understanding of what those terms mean I'm just listening to um, to uh, Jim Staley in identity crisis again every time I listen to it it I just pick up something so profound I was look, listening for a specific um, phrase to or sentence that he had said that was so profound but as I'm listening and trying to find the statement, I'm just about up to it, so I'll be able to share it with you guys, hopefully, before the meeting's over. Um, on It was on the meaning of the Besor, the good news. Uh, but he's talking about the meaning of ger. And I'd missed this before, but the Jews teach that the ger was not the stranger who sojourns among you, how, but it is the person that is, uh, is being proselytized to Judaism. So this is somebody who is leaving uh, the Christian mindset and becoming uh, the Jew that keeps the, the Talmud, Judaism. So this wasn't even uh, a, a belief system sanction, sanctioned by Yahuwah or Yahushua, but they are, they're redefining the word in modern times so that the Gentiles don't realize that they are the strangers sojourning among them that would come in 
and pick up the Torah and keep it. Instead, they've come up with some rules, the Noahide covenant, that um, really prevents a person from keeping the Torah and keeping Shabbat and reading the Torah and calling upon Yahuwah's name. Um, it's very dangerous uh, circumstances. So it's very important that we get back to the original words and what Yahuwah meant by them. And that's why I like working with the dictionaries in the the Hebrew and Chaldean dictionary in the Strong's Concordance, the Greek dictionary in the Strong's Concordance, the etymological dictionary, other classical Hebrew dictionaries will tell us what these words originally meant. And so um, I do, we go through the, them in the modules, module by module, and they're exposed to you as, as the lesson um, is, is put forth. Um, I believe led by the Rock Hakodesh. And also, if you want to cut to the chase, you can just jump on over to Haruak Eliyahu's channel and dig in. He's got an amazing video, something about removing Christianity's pagan trash, which is quite an affront to read the title. But um, it's laid out in love, and it'll get us back to pure truth. Would you My be God. able to um, put that on um, the, the chat? Sure, I can go get the link to that video, and then there's just any host of other videos. That is what they do. They drill down to the original meaning of the word, either so, in the Hebrew or the Greek. So bless, actually, what did you say that meant? Um, and they will go through that. It had to do with some sort, of, and I don't know that much about it. And, and I'll also say that Holy Scriptures, if you go to their website, they will tell you the things they took out of their translation that were pagan, uh, either pagan names of deities or pagan ritual kinds of things, such as the word to bless, um, such as the word grace. They took these words out because they're pagan deities or pagan practices. Um, and what was your question again? I think I didn't get to the answer of it. Um, well, I was asking about bless, you know, because yeah, like so almost every time someone sneezes, you're like, bless you, you know. Um, so the, the original meaning of that word, the Hebrew word barak, is to strengthen, which, of course, if someone is, is uh, showing signs of coming down with something, their immune system is being hit, which is usually what is going on if somebody starts sneezing. Their body's trying to eject something out, and that comes out about 400 miles an hour um, out of a person's nose. Um, they're trying to eject that uh, bacteria or what have you that's coming uh, to infect them. And so they need to be strengthened. And whether it's a cold coming on them or they have been, they're, they're laying in a hospital bed recovering from a, a horrible car accident, all the children of Yahuwah need to be strengthened by having his name put on them. That strengthens them. Um, we don't have to go through chemotherapy and things like that. When Yahuwah has given us his name to strengthen us, and he says if we will keep his commandments, he'll bring on us none of the diseases that came on the Egyptians. Um, the, the blessing word has to do with, with some sort of bloodletting or blood sing. Blood sing is what the word is, is, comes from. Darla, I, I do have Eliyahu Ruach's replacement theology correction of words for anybody that wants it. Perfect. Can you put it up in, um, in hip chat? Yeah, do you want me to share so everybody knows what it looks like? Yes. Sure. It's got apostle, Bible, bless, Christ, church, charity, Krishna, faith, fear, grace, Gentile, gospel, glory, God, ghost, heaven, uh, deities, holy, hope, Jesus, justice, king, kingdom, law, liberty, Lord, and that's it. It's got 25 different words, so I can post that in hip chat for uh, anybody that wants it. Is it hip chat or is it the other one? Uh, either I can post, I can post it in both, but I did send this to you uh, in a personal message, Mike, uh, on hip chat when you asked about it. But I'm gonna Sweet. I'm gonna post it in both hip chat and Discord for everybody that that way if they want it they have it. Thank you. I did watch Eliyahu Ruach's video, and I suggest if, if you guys are wanting to learn about these, to, to please go watch his video. It is very good. They are very good.
Anybody else want to share? Uh, I I have one thing about the the what we were talking about earlier. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, <clears throat> this is um, well, this is the King James, but he he said, "For I'm jealous over you with yeah yeah godly jealousy, but I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you." A chaste virgin to Christ. Well, this is pagan names, but uh, you get the mean a chaste virgin, and he, he is speaking this to the. Um, this is the um, Corinth. I I think I think he's not meaning literally virgins. Exactly, and this goes to the to the hundred forty four thousand. Very good point, Harold. This is a spiritual yeah. concept. This is not sexually that he's going to turn them back into virgins. It's not yeah. to be interpreted that way. That's a good point, my brother. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. I just, I just remember this. Uh, yeah. they, they are, I think they're definitely not sexually or, or physically virgins. Right. And, and that's what um, Ariel Cole, I'll, put, I'll get that video and, and post it for you. It's, it's very interesting to hear it from a, a Jewish perspective because it's just like Paul is saying, this has nothing to do with their sexuality. This is about their spiritual condition, right? That, that in the process of coming out of her, my people, which means coming out of the false doctrine, you are a virgin to the truth. You don't know the truth. So it's, it's foreign to you, right? And so you enter into the Torah as a virgin. And that's where yeah. he says this concept of the 144,000 being virgins is. It's not that they, they could be literal, uh, you know, virgins as in they're so young, they've never been with a, a woman, that kind of thing. But it's not, that is not the concept that it, that um, is trying to get across there. It is that spiritual concept uh, like Paul's referring to here with um, chaste virgin to Christ. Um, yeah, like I, I tend to think about it like, like uh, pure and um, sanct uh, hallowed, sanctified, or, or all that. But I, I, may, I don't exactly know what he's meaning, but uh, he's, he's, I think he's definitely not meaning physically or sexually. Right. Very good. Okay, so if nobody's got any tables, uh, I just want to take it back to like what uh, Michael was showing earlier when he was showing a table that he did about his family. And the reason why this is good to, to do this kind of searching is because you know you, right? This is the code searcher table here. And in the incredible detail um, I was able to extract in here, it's because I know me, I, I you know, and I know what's relevant to me. Um, so, so with nicknames, the code searcher, how many code searchers in the world are there? I mean, there's not like there's 10,000 of them in, in this part and there are 20,000 over here. No. <laughs> when you have a, a person's name, it's a proper name, Jonathan Wright, there's literally millions, probably millions. I know for a fact that here in this town, and I was surprised that when I went to the bank and set up an account, there's four Jonathan Wrights in this area. Four, uh, right? So how many are there worldwide? You get what I'm talking about? So if you're looking up Jonathan Wright in the codes, you're more than likely going to have every Jonathan Wright. You have to isolate from that point an individual. How do you do that? Well, it's very difficult with proper names. What? With, with surnames, nicknames, you can do this quite easily. Um, the code searcher is very unique to me, and, and here it is also at a skip that's relative to my birthday like uh I'll, I'll just tell you that that 73 is very important right incidentally I also found this sequence of numbers off to the side of my social security number so that's pretty intriguing but here's the thing let's go over some of the terms in here first of all the code searcher is the access term jonathan is in plain text not far from the code searcher jonathan it's also um here a couple of times as it, it's also here. This is John, check this out. 
Not only is it in the plain text, I'll blow it up so you can see this really clearly. This is Jonathan, this, this, this word here, Yod Bob Noon Tet Tav, excuse me, Yod Bob Noon Tav Noon is Jonathan. Watch right here. Yod Bob Noon Tav Noon, stopping at that, that noon there. That's Jonathan. Going in the other direction, Yod Bob Noon Tav Noon. So we got Jonathan wow. going both directions. Jonathan, Jonathan, pointing in on itself on the Tav. The Tav of a very significant letter. Why is a Tav a significant one? What, what does that represent? The Tav. The mark. The mark. Right. mark. right. So you got Open Jonathan, it. Jonathan. In the very center, you've got the mark right there, that red Tav. But not only that, you've got Ben or running right through the Vav in the Jonathan. Son of light. Son of light. Uh. Ben or son of light. <clears throat> then you got vertical right next to that. You got the name Darla. Oh wow! Darla in the wow. blue, but then the extension to that is Lev. Anybody know what Lev is? Mm. Darla's heart. Where's Darla? Oh wow! Oh, how yeah. sweet! Where's Darla's heart? It's with Jonathan, and she's very close to Jonathan. You see this? The, the, the proximity to this. That is cool. Look what her name is sitting on. She's a daughter of Jerusalem. Oh, wow. It doesn't say son. It says daughter of Jerusalem. That's awesome. Right? In reverse, in the plain text, it says mem ibrit, from the Hebrews. So from the mem, in reverse, ibrit, from the Hebrews. Okay? Um, going a little further over, you see ruach. Yod Vafe, the spirit of Yod Vafe. Holy One of Israel. And this is talking about Yeshua, Kadosh Israel. Appears 14 times in the scriptures. He's showing his table. Yeah. Then we got Jonathan, ELS, uh, ELS term, Jonathan, right there. But then looking at each one of those, where those letters are hitting. So uh, I'll read the verse here in a minute, but we'll just go down to the Bob and we see that those, those letters means my servant. Obedi. Obedi is my servant. Then right next down to the next letter, what we got there, Hanavi, which is a prophet. I'm not saying that's what my name, what I am. I'm just showing you what's there. And then going down to another relevant uh, uh, phrase that runs right through the Tav, like it's in sequence there. Um, and then this right here, this this chapter and verse that's running right through everything. And incidentally, this is my middle name, Matthew, and then a, an extension that runs on there with hidden. Zophan is connected to that. Um, but the chapter and verse is where this is. It's very peculiar and interesting. It's talking about a seer. Before there were prophets in the Bible, they were called seers. They, they saw the future, right? So we find this in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 9. And I'll, I'll get it, give, give us some context to this and what's going on. But this is running right through the top of my table uh, talking about me. And I'm not saying that I'm a prophet or anything like that, guys. I'm not, it's not what I'm saying or why I'm showing you this. I'm just showing you the details that you can extract in your name. Your name here, you'll find these same kind of things uh, that, that, that screams to you. I'm not just an anomaly. I'm not just this forgotten human being that was created by um, this omnipotent, majestic, all-powerful being. He actually knows every hair on my head. He actually knows my name before I came out of the womb. He actually knows, right? So the details that you see in, in your table should impact you to the, to the point where I'm not just an accident. I have a purpose in, in this life. And he shows you that in these, in these particular tables that are about you, right? So let's, let's look at 9.9. 9. Um, before in time of Israel, when a man went to inquire of Elohim, 
Thus he said, come and let us go see the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So Samuel was a seer. Okay, and that's who, that's who Saul was inquiring. This is, this is Saul is, in, is sending out to, to uh, Samuel to know the future. He wants to know what's going on. And then Saul to his servant said, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of Elohim was. And as they went up to the ascent to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, is this the seer here? And they answered him and said, he is, behold, he is before thee. Make haste now, for he is coming today into the city. For the people have a sacrifice today in the high place. So they, Saul's wanting to know some information. He sends some, some out before him to go find this Samuel and happens to be at a time where there's some sacrifices going on. There's, there's religious duties going on. Um, and this is how they find him. Before excuse me, before there is ever uh, mentioned of a prophet. What's really cool in here is we got the word tov, which is good. But you also got Darla's name is encoded in there. Tob and then Darla right next to that. It's in the same chapter and verse that, that, that's speaking about this seer running right through uh, my table, connections to my name. Matthew is running vertical up there. Uh, with an extension. Let's see what that white. Uh, this is also 2 Samuel. Chapter 7, verse 25 is what I got highlighted. Let's see what it says there. And thou, O Yuhu Elohim, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, confirm thou it forever and do as thou hast spoken and let thy name there's a connection to the name in my table. Let thy name be magnified forever. And that it may be said, Yahuwah Zavaot is Elohim over Israel. And the house of the servant David shall be established before thee. For thou, O Zavaot, Yahuwah Zavaot, the Elohim of Israel, has revealed to thy servant. I will build thee a house before thy, thy servant, taking out thy heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Yahuwah Zavaot, thou art, thou alone art Elohim, and thy words are true, and thou hast promised this good thing to thy servant. What? I, now, in, in the context of the scripture, the plain text is telling you something in the plain text. But when you're looking at a, a, a table with the, the concept and the precept that we're focusing on is the, the topic, code searcher, right? And, and then the verses and chapters that run through here. Now, any chapter and verse could have gone through my table um, that, that the father wanted to put in there. But he specifically chose the access term to be on a on a on a skip width that it's on so that the verses he wanted me to read would be in this matrix. In other words, it happens to fall together this way because he designed it to, right? So when I'm reading some of these that are running right through my name, like, like Matthew is vertical here, that's my middle name. And then I read that in the very, you know, the very uh, matrix that I'm looking at, you know, uh, my surname, which is the code searcher, or nickname, and then all of the relevant details that I find in here. And there is a place in here where it says, uh, and I, I gotta remember where it is, but it says something to the fact he searched for his father, or he, he went looking for his father, or something like that. Now, in the context of the plain text, it's telling one story, but in my own personal life, that's something that I actually did. I didn't get to know my dad until I was like 26 years old. I didn't know who he was. Um, the, the man I thought was my father committed suicide in my presence. And so my mother let my father die with that man, right? Because I was so traumatic at six years old. It was traumatic to me. Mom, how, how would the mother say, you know, honey, that, that wasn't your dad. Your, your dad's actually. So that, that was a, a conundrum my, my mother was in. What do I do to this little brokenhearted little child, right? So she said, I will delay this. I'll tell him when he's older, right? And so as I'm getting older and going through, 
16, 18, graduating, my mom kept putting it off because it wasn't the right time. What if he rejects me? What if he's mad at me? Right? So she, she never had this right time to tell me what happened was the Holy spirit told me, I kid you not. I had no indication, none that my father was someone else. One day it came to me and I started thinking, I get this picture and I'm looking at my, what I think is my dad, right? And I'm looking at some of the dates on the back, like the, the year that I was born and the year before this man was in Vietnam, right? And I'm looking at the dates on this picture of him in Vietnam, the year before and the year I'm born, and something's clicking going, wait a minute. You are telling me the truth. This guy isn't mine. And the Holy Spirit's telling me, this, he's not your dad. Your, your dad's a lie. And this is like blowing my mind. I'm going, what is this in my head? Why is, what, what am I hearing? Right? Thinking, I mean, guys, if, imagine this. The father you have right now, and you start hearing a voice in your head saying, that's not your father. It will blow your mind. You mean, what? What are you talking about? What, where is this coming from? I'm going crazy. And then I find this picture, and I hear it again. He is not your father. He is not your father. And so I go asking around. I go ask my mom's youngest sister. Uh, I found this picture, and I'm praying about it, and um, something's not acting, adding up, Aunt Jackie. Something's not right in my, my Aunt Jackie. My hand to the father says to me, I told your mama when I was a little girl that I would not lie if you ever came to me and asked me. Because my, my Aunt Jackie is my mama's youngest sister. So she was just like 12 years old, 13 years old when, when you know, my mom got pregnant. She was a little girl, but she knew the truth. And she told my mama when she was a little girl, if he ever comes to me and asks me, I can't lie to him about it, right? And she did. And she, she didn't know what I knew or how I knew it, but she said that to me. And she's like, so you're telling me that I'm on the right track. This guy is not my father. And she was like, he's not your dad. And I was like, do you know who my dad is? And she was like, I know who your dad is, but I – you have to ask your mom of that. I don't even know where he is. So what happened was I approached my mom very cautiously and with a lot of love and, and told her beforehand, I love you more than anything. I'm not mad at you. I know you were probably protecting me, but here's what I know. And man, she had tears streaming down her face. She'd carried this burden up so long in her life and was so worried that I was going to reject her. Right. It's not what happened. The Holy Spirit had, had softened my heart to, to a point was I was kind of, kind of happy. Like now I got this chance to know a father I never knew. Right. All this stuff started rushing in. So being mad at her was the farthest thing from my mind, but that was what terrified her that I would reject her and never speak to her again. So now that her, her heart is relieved and she sees, she sees this. Now she's telling me, uh, what happened? She was 17 years old, fell into, fell in love with an army guy. Um, he was about to go to Vietnam and, you know, and he was coming back and, you know, he'd had problems. His, his helicopter, he was in a helicopter crew, a Huey that was shot down. He was the only one that survived. Right. And this, he came home, met my mom. They had, she had me. So, so think about that. This guy almost died in Vietnam. He was shot down. This is what the story he told me. He's sitting, he's a machine gunner in a Huey, and a mortar comes through the bottom of the helicopter between his legs and goes up through the ceiling into the rotors and blows up in the rotors. And the whole helicopter falls about 100 feet down to the ground. Everybody is killed except my dad. That's a true story. That's divine right there. Yeah. Wow. He had a purpose. Because after he came home and he's going through all these troubles and, and stuff like that, he meets my mom, 17, beautiful 17 year old young lady in Richmond Hill, Georgia, where he was stationed, uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia. And the rest is history, right? My, um, what happened was my mom gets pregnant. My dad moves back to Louisiana where he's from. My grandmother convinces her um, that she needs to be home and not with him. Um, and so there, there's just, he didn't know about me until years later. Anyway, um, the Holy spirit guys revealed that to me.
my mom was probably going to push that can on down the street and keep it kicking down the street because she was not going to confront the, the problem that there was an, a lie going on that I needed to know was the truth about. Right. So the Holy spirit put that in before me and revealed that to me. There was no codes. None of this came about till later, but it, it, you know, in my walk, this is revealing this to me very powerful. But then when I have access to the codes, I can find all that detail. It's right there. <laughs> and so it tells me, just like he says about Jeremiah, he knew it before he come out of the womb, he knew his name. He's going to ordain his steps. It's just the same for every one of us. He, he knows us with such detail, guys. And that's times billions and billions of people. Imagine that. Scripture says he knows when a sparrow falls from the sky. He absolutely knows everyone that has been created and, and lived and died and, and will live in the future. He knows. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the prescription of glasses that I wear. He knows my favorite color. He knows everything. And many times you'll find it in your table. All of these details that nobody knows but the Most High and you. Right? And some of the things you don't even know, you find later. It's called post priori. You find out, you know, some truth later that may not have been forthcoming uh, in the beginning. So incredible details are in these tables, like Michael was shown before. I absolutely believe the Holy Spirit led him to that place so he can grab on to the knowledge that, yes, before that baby even come out of the womb, I knew you were going to have Yosef. I put him in your life, in your wife's life, for a reason. Everything for a reason. My dad survived that helicopter crash for a reason. He could have died in Vietnam. He could have been one of those names on the wall in Washington. But he was specifically chosen out of six crew members to be the only one to live. That's powerful, guys. I would not be sitting here today had my dad died in Vietnam. It wouldn't mean no Jonathan. All right? So uh, that's why I'm so pow uh, passionate about codes and, and what I see there, sp specifically about me personally, what he's revealed to me personally. It just impacted me so much that I knew there's no question um, this is a part of the end times. The unsealing of books, hiding information from the enemy, and the, the, the process of extracting this or unsealing books in the end times. That connection one makes with the Holy Spirit in doing that is very powerful. Nobody can convince me that this is, is a hoax or this is man-made. And I will, I will challenge Dr. Heiser every time he comes out saying the Bible codes are bunk because I know for a fact mm -hmm. he has not put due diligence in and searched it himself. Well, he's no. just taking information already on the Internet and just repackaging it because he's tired of, you know, having to come as an apologetic and explain why code searcher says there's no rapture and this and that, because there's been a lot, we've overturned a lot of thought processes in this. And I've offended a lot of people, especially those in the apologetics and Michael Heiser is one of those. Um, he, he hates the codes. He hates that we're doing this. Uh, he even goes as far as accusing um, Yakov Ramsel, um, Chuck Missler and Grant Jeffries as being a liar and a fraudster. In, in even going and saying they made up Yeshua's codes, basically cut and paste to convince people there were codes in, in Isaiah. That's that, preposterous. That the person has done not one second of legitimate research. Not one second. Because had they done We can so, reproduce it. Yeah, we can, hey, we can. That's right. What can be reproduced in a, in a, uh, a laboratory is yeah. science. That's right. So, sorry, no, Brother Jonathan. Huh? Sorry about that. I didn't mean to cut you off, brother. I don't know. Was, we just got a little lag. Um, but my point is, uh, he has to put due, due diligence in and, and actually research before his uh, debunking is, has any credibility with me. Repackaging, you know, flawed um, data from people like McKay, who is a atheist from Australia, a mathematician who took, took a, a challenge that the rabbis put out, and he actually fabricated 
uh, Moby Dick codes and put them out on the internet and say, oh, we well, can find these codes in Moby Dick. Well, actually you can't, and we can test that. And we know you're lying because your group can't be reproduced. It has to be reproducible, right? You just come with some paper and say, I got codes right here. And you can see Kennedy was shot and, and you know Oswald and all that kind of stuff. Well, I should be able to reproduce that in a table because it's, if you're using a text and you're finding an anomaly, we should be able to find the same anomaly in the text. And, and code finder guys that, that have it and they're working that you have what's called monkey text in there. These books like Moby Dick are gone with the wind that you can do these codes in and see um, that you will, you will never get more. Uh, you'll never get past the point of random occurrence. Let me just say it like that. Random occurrence will happen. You will find Kennedy and maybe shot or something like that. Very, very iffy tables. It looks like it might be something, but you, it doesn't play out. None of the plain text seems to, to correlate. Uh, you have an issue with finding all, you know, the names involved. You may have to do what's called cheating, like Glazerson says, oh, he cheated. That's because they, they are using uh, truncated words, in other words, because they can't get a name. So they got to put in something abbreviated, in other words. Um, that's not exactly code finding. If you've got to twist it, if you've got to manipulate it, you've got to force it in there, then, then it's fabricated, right? If it's there just naturally, and you see these anomalies and all these different things, and it's there naturally, you didn't do that. That's another thing. That's, that's codes. Can I add a layer to this? Yes, ma'am. So um, on, the, on the verse you got there on the top, uh, is this Isaiah still? Right here. 726, and let thy name be magnified forever. Uh, that's Second Samuel. We're, we're, Second Samuel, that's right. By the way, this is all Torah this is in. So this is not spanning all of the books. If for those that may see this and say, oh, it's not a Torah code. Yes, it is. We're, in, we're, we're way up in the Torah up here um, before the books are even kind of switched. So we're way up in the Torah this far up. We're not down in Isaiah until way, well, we're in Psalms by this point. There's Job there. Let's see. Ezekiel's just going to be, there's Jeremiah, so that's probably, probably about midway through. That's probably Isaiah right there. Yeah, let's see what it says in Isaiah. 40, so we're about the 40th chapter at that point. Five. So we're dealing with lots of prophecy. Yes, there is some prophecies in here, but it's further down. And the glory of Yahuwah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of Yahuwah had spoken it. And that's and that's right here and i believe that i believe all flesh will see all so i was gonna say look at that the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness prepare ye the way of yahuwah and that's oh you have codes you have codes in the same line kuf wav dalit yod over there to the left over there to the left and, and in els oh yeah, yeah. yeah i see that there's codes there you're right the glory uh, this, if you've been watching the uh, the live streams, this is how I've been starting off with uh, James Blocks. That's amazing. Isaiah 40. Comfort ye my people. Comfort ye my people. Right? That Comfort ye amazing. my people. And so that's why wow. I've been putting that that out. That's one of my favorites because I feel that, that, he's, that he's given me that man to do, to do to comfort his people even though that i may come with some information that's not comforting um you know but it's it's truth don't there's some people who will compromise and will try to encourage and they will sacrifice the truth for the sake of encouraging in other words i've confronted two bible coders that are doing english codes both of them both told me they're not worried about being accurate or all they want to do is, is encourage. And I, I, as I'm sitting here, Darlo was my witness. I'm talking to both of these people privately, urging them, please, you know, you have to be on point on your codes. You, you can't put out stuff that's got mistakes in it, misspell words and just bunk and make it look like it's legitimate. You're fooling people. And both of them at different times, one was Kurt, 
and one was Matthew 24, the Matthew uh, Monte Carlo 24 uh, guy. Both told me, I'm not worried about being accurate. My, I'm trying to encourage the body. And I was shocked. I was like, wait a minute. So you're, you're willing to sacrifice the truth for the sake of encouraging. That's not even right. That's just, that's wrong. That's strange fire. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to sacrifice the truth just to encourage. I'm right. not going to sugarcoat it. If, if, it's the, if you need to know this truth and it's to pull you out of a false doctrine, I have to tell you. Right? Let's see what I see. Bashim, uh, Bashmi there. That's something about the name. My name. Jeremiah 2715 is also in here. Yeah. Oh, telling the Therefore, people life. Not unto the words of the prophets that speak into you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. This is, this is Hananiah that was coming against uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was oh, the my only... Goodness. He was the only prophet telling the truth. And this time, all the other ones was tickling the ears of the king. Give it right. up, right? But he says here, I'm not sent them. Go ahead. Uh, it all ties together with this also. That like they are saying, oh, we, we, we make false codes to comfort people. And uh, it's, it's also like uh, um, uh, parents telling, uh, lying to the baby that there's a Santa Claus coming to put something in the shoe just to, to make it make it happy. Yeah. It's all lies. Yeah. And it's, for they prophesy a lie unto you. That's exactly right. Right. Uh, the, the, pro the prophet of America tells you, I'm not coming to tell him about doom and gloom. You know, this is, this is um, Mark Taylor. He says, I'm, my message is not about doom and gloom. I'm going to bring encouragement. I'm, I'm going to sugarcoat it. He didn't say that, but that's basically what he's saying. And Yeshua hey. says, for I have not sent them, saith Yahuwah, they prophesy a lie in my name that I uh, might drive you out, that ye might perish. And the prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, also I speak to the priests and to the people, saying, thus saith Yahuwah, hearken not unto the words of your prophets that prophesy to you, saying, behold, the vessel of Yahuwah's house shall shortly be brought again from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. Now, what happened was um, Nebuchadnezzar had, had looted and taken all the vessels, except for some. And there, there is a, uh, a list of things that he actually got, menorahs and things like that. Um, but no Ark of the Covenant. We're told that that was hidden, right? Well, some... We're prophesying in this time, oh, Yahuwah's going to bring back these treasures, king, right? He's going to do all these things. All, sounds so good. And to a nationalist, to, to somebody who wants to see America be great again, it sounds lovely. We want to hear it. This is what we want to hear, right? But what does Yahuwah say? I didn't send them. I didn't send them at all. They're speaking lies. If it goes against what the scriptures are saying, they're lying. God is not doing a new thing. And we spoke about this earlier. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not doing something new. This is all his plan. It's, it's, it's part of the same plan, right? So uh, we just touched briefly. That's amazing, man. And, and that makes a lot of sense that that's there because you've been calling out these false prophets lately. Yeah. That's amazing. That's that an awesome amazing. code. That is amazing. That is, huh, that is beyond awesome, bro. What are you talking about? That's, that's incredible. And the detail, the detail and the proximity. That's how could, how can anybody say no to that? Right. How many and, books is that? Uh, well, this, it spans from, let's just see, it goes from uh, roughly, let's go from the first line there. That's Bamidbar. And then uh, down into the prop. So Ezra down here. So that's like so seven it does, books. It does span. I, I said uh, earlier that it doesn't. Um, there are the code searchers encoded three times, and and one of them is further up. This one's down further than I. Wow, called. man! So I was inaccurate when I said it. There are some prophets in here, but in the other ones I have, they're further up in the Torah. Um, the other two, with this same term, uh, and has you know just a just 
equivalent to the amount of detail. Uh, here, here's a term here, shulukhin, shulukhin or shuluk. You guys know what shuluk is? Shuluk mm. is an emissary. So when you got shulukhin, mm. he is my emissary. And also when anytime you got that yod on the end, he's saying my. And just like over here with abedi, he's saying my servant. So my emissary. So it's a confirmation to me, indeed, he is sending me. He, he, he is specified in this code. Because, listen, the enemy will come and try to, and he does it, he's done it with me. Come to me and say, you are nobody special. He's not using you. You don't even know you. You know, you'll go that far. The enemy will go try to steal your joy and say, you don't know who you are. But then the father shows this to me and says, oh, yes, I do. And I know everything about you. I know it before it happens because I have purposed in it because you are special to me. And I'm speaking about all of you guys. I'm not just talking about me. I'm using me as an example. But if you are a believer and the fact that, that we in this group talk about the name, you are specifically, I guarantee you, and I put my life on this because the word says it. He says that your name is written in a special book. Because you have taken the time to think about his name. That's the only qualification. He says, they are gathering and talking about my name. And so, because they have done that, I will make them a diadem, a jewel in my crown. Mm. Wow. That's every one of you guys. You are qualified under that because we have been talking about the name, and it's a, and it's a thing. You read... You read Malachi. It's a very big thing. He even says to the priests and the and the, uh, the preachers that reject his name, you hated my name. You despised my name. And they say to him, where have we despised your name, Lord? Right? These Christians today. I don't have to say Yeshua. That's, that's a part of that Hebrew roots movement. I don't use that name. I use Jesus. Or I say God because he knows my heart. Even though the scripture says the heart is wicked beyond measure mm. right so just the fact that we are thinking and talking about his name maybe even discussing how you pronounce his name i don't know the scriptures just say they are talking about my name and therefore i will record in this book this special book called a book of remembrance that they're doing this and i'm going to make them a jewel in my diadem guys i don't care what the naysayers say to me about teaching the names my elohim just told me there's something about this. You are special to me because you consider, you considered my name and the importance of it. You didn't just throw away and say, oh, he knows my heart. And you go and look at some of the other scriptures like Psalm 91, and there's a qualification, guys. Psalm 91, because he knew my name, I will not reject him. Um, uh, Revelation 3, what does it say there? Because he kept my commandments. And he knew my name. It has a qualification there about the name. It's very powerful, this name, guys. And to make light of it, as some of these theologians with all their you know, stuff on their wall saying how important they are, blow past it. I'll tell you this one um, testimony before we, we close out. I saw a very well-known author and, and teacher on the Internet. You guys may know him. He wrote a book with Tom Horn about the Vatican. You guys know who I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chris, uh, Chris, uh, Chris uh, yeah. Chris Putnam. Yep, and he died, when, uh, what, a couple years ago? Dropped dead very, very quickly. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you what I witnessed before, and I'm not the only one that saw this. It's, it's documented. I did a video about it. Chris Putnam wrote an article about Rob Skiba, and he was being really nasty. He was calling Rob Skiba a deceiver, and, you know, teaching people about a bunch of nonsense about the name. A sac he was calling him a sacred name or cult and all this guy. He was, he was really dogging. I, I remember mean, that. He was dogging Rob Skiba. Rob Skiba was coming back. They were back and forth on Facebook, guys. Everybody was watching this. And he was telling everybody how stupid people, he actually used the word, how stupid people were following Rob Skiba and, and teaching the name. And he was dogging Rob Skiba about using the name, teaching the name, and all that, right? Rob Skiba had a little bit of class about him and said, you know, and, and defended himself very well with scriptures. What happened to Chris Putnam? 
He drops dead not too long ago after that. Drops dead, folks. Unexpected. People are shocked. What do we attribute to? Just it was his time? I don't think so. I think the father was offended that he came against, so strongly and so publicly came against the name in a movement that was just starting, restoring that name. He took him out. He is the one that gives life and takes life, folks. There's no question about it. And the evidence is this man very publicly came against the name of the Most High. And within weeks, he was dead. Folks, I will leave you with that to, just, to you know, consider. And I didn't say that because I want to be hateful or inconsiderate or insensitive to Chris Putnam's family. But the facts are the facts. There were several hundreds of people that witnessed this thing that happened between him and Rob Skiba. I had my mouth shut until Chris Putnam died. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yep. He should have yep. never said nothing. He should have never come against a, a man that is trying to teach the truth. Because once he did, he, he even if he's righteous, when he when he did that, he immediately put himself in the in the category of coming against a righteous person. The father took him out. There's no other way, way to put that. And that is that's the truth. This guy very hatefully came against Rob Skiba, and I got to give it to Rob. Rob kept some class about him and only cited scriptures and. The rest is history, guys. And when I witnessed that, I was like, that's sealed for me. The name is powerful. Father, I will teach your name. And I find it in my table where he's, where he's talking about those same things, revealing the name, uh, where all flesh will see it and believe and all this kind of stuff. I believe it 100%. 100%. It's, it's an important thing to do. I even see Ooh. something about the name right there. Um, and that... Uh, Jonathan. Look at that before we... Yeah, go ahead. I want uh, to see what that is. Jonathan. Yes. Uh, I, I was, uh, I think we have about 15 or 20 minutes left. Uh -huh. If it's possible, could we, could you show, maybe in the end or something, could you show us the the Daniel, uh, you know where the, the names are of the code services. Yeah, I'd have to go and pull up um, that table. I, I got to see which what I hey, have. Uh, hey, brother, I've got something I need to share with you too before we close, if that's okay. See right here, and I can probably find a, a dozen of these connected uh, because there's over 400 scriptures, guys, that, that say something about the name. But here we are in Proverbs 18, one of my favorite ones, one of the ones that Darla likes to cite. And you can't get around the truth of it. The name of Yahuwah is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and is safe. Rob Skiba oh, ran man. to this strong tower, and he is safe, guys. You cannot go wrong with the name. I promise you, you cannot go wrong. Let them say, sacred namer, all they want. You are the one in the right. Because the scripture says, the name of Yahuwah is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. That's the truth. That is absolutely true. Those who, they will not be held blameless who come against or take his name in vain. That's exactly right. And that's what that means. Taking his name in vain does not mean using his name. That means, yeah. Allah will confirm this, is to bring his name to nothingness. Amen. That's what the interpretation of, of that is. To bring his name to, in other words, to cause people to forget his name is using his name in vain. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. bring his name to forget, to, for the people to forget. That is what's wrong. And that's exactly what the Jews have been doing, hiding his name, concealing it, because it's too holy. Well, yeah. yes, it's holy, but the Father says it's power in it. To declare it, that when you're in distress, you are to run to him, run to his name. When Yeshua came, what was he doing? He, was te he says in John, Father, I taught them your name. If he taught yeah. them something, it was probably because they didn't know it. Why did they didn't know it? Because at that time, in Yeshua's time, the common folk didn't know the name of the Father. Only the Levites did because it was in the temple scrolls. The common people didn't know the name. So a common folk like Yeshua walking around telling people the name, and you got in scriptures the Talmudim saying, 
How does this man know the letters? What letters is he talking about? Are you talking about the Aleph Bet? Or is he talking about yod heh Because it's very clear. He says, I'm teaching the name. And the Talmudim says, how does he know those letters? Yeah. It's self-explanatory to me, folks. He came teaching exactly. something that wasn't known at the time. Why? Restoration. He's restoring us back to the Father. Folks, that is the good news of the gospel. That he came to restore us back to the Father. And it can only be done by his death. That is the great mystery Paul talks about. Because in a divorce in Judaism, it's final. There is no remarriage. And so when we see in Hosea that he puts Israel away, but in the same book, he brings her back again? Paul's thinking, how does this compute? It's a great mystery. Nobody understands this, right? Yeah, you can't remarry until death. You until can't. The you can't unless, until, uh, and that unless that marriage is sealed with a death. The husband yeah. has to die. And that's why he died. And that's why he died. He comes and back that. to reconcile us. And so he has a what an, another marriage contract. It's under the same kind of concept, but it's a new one. It's a new covenant. Not like the old ones that I made with your fathers, which they broke. Right? That's what he says. This is a new one. And who's he making that with? I'm making it with Judah and with Israel. And if you're not part of those two, you got a problem. If you consider yourself outside that camp, there is nothing that refers to you. You are either or. And so this is what the fullness of the Gentiles is implying, that you are Israel. And when the fullness thereof comes, that's when he returns. You can find this in uh Genesis 48, when Jacob prophesies this, telling Ephraim, you will be the fullness of the Gentiles. When you see a cup that's full, overflowing, that's the fullness. Incidentally, I see America and Great Britain and those uh, territories that are connected through that, Australia, New Zealand, and such, they are of Ephraim or Menashe those two sons. And in that, the flag of Ephraim encompasses all of the northern tribes. This honor was given to Ephraim by Jacob himself. The law would not depart from Judah, but the banner is with Ephraim. Do you understand that? Judah would always have the Torah, and they would always preserve that. That's why we have the, the what we have today is because of the meticulous attention to details that Jews have in record keeping. Yeah. It says the law will not depart from Judah and Ephraim will be the one with the banner. That means all of the Northern tribes come under the banner Ephraim, no matter what you are, whether you're Ish, Ish, uh, Ishakar or uh, Asher or whatever, those tribes come under Ephraim. They're not lost guys. He spread them like seeds. He scattered them like seeds on the earth. And when a farmer scatters, scatters seeds, he don't just do that and then burn the field. What does he do? He comes back later and he gathers that harvest in. He didn't scatter them to punish. He scattered them to graft us in. Does that make sense? So when he said, I only came for the lost sheep of Israel, and then we see in John 3, 16, for Yahuwah loved the whole world that he gave his only son. It seems to con contradict one another until you understand what the fullness of the Gentiles is. The fullness of the Gentiles is encompassing the world into Israel because Israel is the only place to be. You want to be in that group. The grafting. Romans 11, when Paul is understanding this, this grafting in, it had to be because there was a blood war going on in the heavens, guys. These fallen angels who have tried to pervert and destroy you, who is creation through the blood. Why? Because the life is in the blood. All this imagery about the blood is, is a blood war. When Satan tried to pervert creation, it was through the blood. And what came out of that was the Nephilim, the hybrids, the perversion. So what does Yahuwah do? 
he, he chooses a nation through a man called Abraham. He said, this is mine. And through Abraham, he preserves that purity, destroys the rest. It had to be done. It's not. Some people say, well, he's killing women and children. This is a hateful God. That is not the Elohim we're, we're serving here. He's not oh. killing innocents. He's killing mm -hmm. perversion. That was the reason for the flood, guys. Yeah, there may have been Nephilim children that died. These are soul. You have to understand what that is. These are soulless individuals who have no resurrection because it was never intended for fallen angels to procreate. They had to be destroyed. So we don't serve a, a, a hateful Elohim. We serve a just Elohim. And that's why and they, he they took, the, took a man out. He destroyed him and he preserved this people because this is where Israel came out of. And not just Israel, Ishmael also came out of that. So we also have the Arab nations. Incidentally, Ishmael was a circumcised son, folks, just like Jacob. This means he has a legal right. He has a legal hold to the land. And that's why we see what's happening with the Palestinians in Israel today. They're not enemies. They're brothers. Mm -hmm. You understand? Ishmael and Isaac were brothers, half-brothers, but brothers nonetheless. And so when we see this fighting, it goes on very br brutal in some cases. We're actually watching two half-brothers destroy one another. They're both, they're both covenant sons. Now, one may not have the Torah, but he's still a covenant son in the, in the cutting process, in the, the shedding of the blood, the, the cutting of the foreskin. That process makes him a legitimate heir to that mountain, to that place. And that's why we're going to have, I believe, a mosque and a temple, guys. Right? Even though he's not in that mosque, but Ishmael is a, is a circumcised son. And then, and then that's why when you say, well, if he's the God or Elohim of, of the mountain, why did he allow that? That's why, because one of these sons had a legitimate connection through covenant in there. Right. Uh, so, sorry, Jonathan, just one question. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, you gave, you gave us the, uh, the coat pack you were, with your coach you were working on, I, I was wondering, is there this, like this Daniel coach with where the coach, the names of the coaches are, uh, is it in there? Yeah, let me look and see. Be because uh, Mar Marissa really wants to see her name there. I, I personally, I, I definitely know it's there, but... <coughs> It would, be, it would be cool to show us. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm going to need some time to remember what that is under. Just, just to give you an example, let me, let me just show you. All right, so here's my files here. You guys able to see this? Uh, I have to go through all of these and uh, put, I, I don't remember what it's titled, but it is in there. So... Um, yeah. I'll go and review the, the um, video or the class that we did where I, where I showed that and see exactly where I have it listed um, because I don't recall it right now where I have it. It seems like I, I dubbed it Daniel or Code Searchers and Daniel or something. Yeah. Um, I will have that for the next class, by the way. Okay. Mar Marissa really wants to say her name. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I will get that and I will see if your name is there and uh, well, I'm pretty sure it is. And I'll, I'll have that for the next. That sounds promising. <laughs> I'll yeah. see if your name's there. Wait, but I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> I, I had to do this with Marissa. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Hey, if I climb back there. It's really cool to see that. Uh, very close proximity, the, the names. Um, do you have a table in there about Mr. Kleck? Yeah, John. I would love to know about that as well. <laughs> yeah, I've got John Gleck. I've done Stephen Denoon. What do you think I've about done... Jonathan Kleck? 
Oh my goodness. You know, I, I believe the father will use even the nonsense of, of the, the, the best of us or the best intentions to, to accomplish his will. Now, I don't believe, I believe one that minute is. that Jonathan Cleck is a fallen angel or anything like that. Right. That's what he right. says. He says he's a fallen angel. Now, he has a clear misunderstanding of what Benai Elohim is. Okay, yes. Elohim is a very generalized term. It does not mean gods, just gods. Elohim right. can, you can be an Elohim, folks. If the father says, Sherry, go and tell Jacob this message. By default, Sherry is an Elohim of the Most High. In other words, he's a messenger. She's a messenger from the Most High. And he, she comes in the power of his name. For instance, uh, you know, you are a representation of your parents, right? In other words, yeah. like, like, like Micah and is a representation of his, of his dad. Good point. When Micah comes in, into, you know, or any kind of situation. He's, he's not just coming in his name. He's coming in his father's name as well. That's what happens mm -hmm. when Yahuwah sins. You're not coming in your, your name. Right. right? You're, he's giving you the authority and the power to, to come in his name as that messenger. And therefore, the term Elohim is applicable. Elohim is so general, it doesn't just, it don't mean gods or, or God. Mm -hmm. It means messengers or uh, servants. It, it's very broad. So when I see Jonathan Cleck saying, the scripture says, you're all Elohims, meaning you're all gods with a little g. That is inaccurate. That is Mormon doctrine. Mormons teach that. Mormons teach that you will die and become That's God. Right. That and that you right. will have your own planet, just like our Elohim. It's just, you know, reproduced, you know, those that make it get to become an Elohim and get their own planet. That's part of Mormon doctrine, guys. I do think that he's that, correct with the, the, the um, way that everything is upside down. And if he's not, I know the father did use that to wake me up, to show yeah. me that where I For am sure. actually. Yeah. And that's so what that I'm saying. Was refreshing. I believe that Jonathan's got a, got a, uh, discernment but he did well, ruin me a little that. with the elohim thing because yeah. when i met y'all it it, it kind of darla helped me a lot because yeah. i was like a little ruined by that i was i was very apprehensive yeah and that's because you know what i mean not so, have an understanding yeah, I, of what that is right. and he's, it's really hard to read it, jonathan yeah. because if you try to explain something to him he gets offended he does you can't tell him I'm nothing yes he gets and really mad and arrogant if you try to – he'll block you and all that kind of stuff if you try to correct him. And so I don't even try yep. – And he'll tell you that you're going to the lake of fire. He's telling people that you're going to go to the pit if you don't – if you can't see the dead sheep on somebody's yeah, head. Yeah, because he's the only one that's gotten this. And yeah. Like, all right. Now, so I believe that the father can it. use that. He has. I believe it too. And, and wake people up, but that doesn't mean that Jonathan is right on everything he says. Absolutely. I think right. that he may have some, some. But issues. I'm glad to know I'm that you accusing. feel that way. Because I do believe that the Vatican does look like, I do, I think that's all true. Sure. The snake, I mean, like, it's pretty clear as day. Yeah. There's only one that can damn you to hell, to the lake of fire. Yeah. Right. And it's yeah, not right. Jonathan Cleck. That's, <laughs> that's exactly good. right. And that's, you know, listen, the thief that was on the cross beside Yeshua, the only qualification for him to be accepted was that he believed. And the same thing for you. That is all you have to do is believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and he died for you and rose again. And that he's I mean, just the belief in him is the qualification. Mm -hmm. Just because Tell somebody me. on YouTube says you're going to die and, and go into hell because you can't see this is nonsense, folks. That is, that is not biblical. If that's yeah. the case, none of us would have a chance that, that, that thief on the cross would have not had a chance at all. But what did Yeshua say? I, today, today you will be with me in paradise. And, and that was it. He was sealed. He was sealed. We don't have to complicate salvation. It's a matter of believing in him. Sure. Right? Now, when we start to make things complicated, and, and you know, that's when things can get kind of messy. Uh, when we when we make salvation complicated and it's not yeah right it's very simple you just believe in him uh, and and 
and the rest is walked out. Like if you're, if you're, you know, if you're smoking cigarettes and the time you're getting saved and you die the next day and the preacher says, Oh, she's, she's gone to hell. Cause you know, she's smoking cigarettes. No, that person believed in Yeshua and that he might have a problem or an addiction, but that does not disqualify them from, from, right. mercy, from mercy from the Amen. father because he, he is merciful. Right. Mm. There's a difference between iniquity. Iniquity is willfully sinning and that you know you're sinning and you're doing it anyway. Right. And, and the problem with it, the once saved, always saved people is they get caught up in an iniquity problems because they, some believe that because I was saved at 12 years old. And, and I know this from, from personal experience. I have two uncles that are brothers that are pastors of the same church. The oldest one has a son that's a homosexual and he's once saved, always saved preacher. And the reason for that is because he does not or he cannot fathom the thought that his oldest son is going to hell for homosexuality. And so he compromises. And his message is, well, you got saved when you was 12 years old. And it don't matter if you're beating your wife at 36. You're still going to heaven because you're once saved, always saved. And that's a lie from hell, guys. You have to walk it out. Yeah, you're saved because you believe, but, but there, there's some walking in, involved, right? Now, the grace the grace comes into, into play when you stumble, but you're trying. You're trying to walk this out. And you might have stumbled, right? That's where his love picks you up and say, pushes you off and say, you can do this. But when you're going down to the bar every Friday and Saturday night, and then Sunday you're repenting because you believe that, you know, you're covered. You can trample, you can trample grace like Paul's talking about and sin over and over and over again, because you, believe that you can just ask for forgiveness and that's as easy as that. That's a Catholic kind of mindset that, you know, all you gotta do is repent. Well, that, that is true, but you're not given authority to just willfully walk in in sin. All right. There's a difference between willfully doing, and I'm not saying there's mercy. If you do that, you're willfully walking in sin and you come to the point at some point you say, I can't do this no more. And you hit rock bottom. And that's a different story. But if you go into an eternity and you still a hardcore drinker and beating your wife and stuff, and you just asking for forgiveness every time, I don't know that you're going to find mercy on the other side. I can't say that you will. Right. Scripture says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in your walk, you know, and you're, you know, you should be convicted that, yeah, I'm going to the bar every freaking Friday and it's not right. And your heart starts working on you. Right. And you get into the real, place of repentance and then he says you know you call on me I'll, I'll answer i'll give you strength you want strength to beat that addiction i'll help you right and then that walk he's cleaning you up he's picking you up and cleaning you up right and so you are covered in in mercy even as an alcoholic you're trying to beat this thing but not if you just play in church guys and you just play in church and going and running and living like a hellion on the weekends and then play in church, you know, that, that can probably be very dangerous to do. Um, I don't, I don't see it as an authentic walk. I think it's play in church. And a lot, I think a lot of Christians are doing that today is they play church. Hey, Hey, Hey brother. Yeah. yeah I've got something I want to share um, in regards to your table. Sure. If, if that's okay. Absolutely, um, yeah. By the way, I, I apologize if I interrupted at all. I was just super excited. Um, it's a lag sometimes. It's no big deal. Uh, that table, you. Uh, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of all of us for sharing that. A very personal um, table that you that you had showed in. Um, this, uh, you know, I didn't. I never really wanted to share it with anybody because it's personal and. You know, I encourage you guys, if, you're, if you want to search and, and, and sharpen your skills, Yeshua codes or something about you because you know the details about you, right? You know, the, anyway, I would encourage that, Scott. Don't, don't feel like it's not something you can't share. I think. Right. Not, no, I just personally, I'm real careful. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I've always been like that. There's no judgment here. 
Yeah. You know, it's just for me. That's just for me. You know, and I don't, ju- I don't judge anybody, and I don't look anybody like you or Jonathan or anybody else for because you know I, I've looked for some personal stuff, and I'm about to share something just because of the fact. Uh, of what Jonathan had shared and what you had shared and it's very relevant to what Jonathan had shared because here we are in Jeremiah 28 right same thing Hananiah and Jeremiah now I don't know how to feel about the context when we're looking at the specific verse and when we're looking at the whole chapter it can take on it could go either way in its meaning and in its context and I'm not saying anything. I'm just showing you what I found. Uh, Jeremiah 28, 9. The prophet with, which prophesieth peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that Yahuwah hath truly sent him. Now, it sounds pretty good in its, in its singular, you know, in what it's talking about in just that verse, but we know that uh, he... Hananiah uh, takes the yoke from uh, Jeremiah's neck. Okay, so I found when we lay this verse out in in code, just in one verse, we're going to do this live and in person. Yes. Bet Wav Noon Alaflamin. That's my last name, okay? There it is, twice. Hallelujah. That's amazing. 144, Skip. Yeah. That's no, no, that's, wow. oh, that's from the last, that's from the last video. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, just, I had that, that's at a skip of 50. That's how many letters are in that verse. Still could have been meant to look at that number. And uh, whether or not my first name is in there, I don't uh, I thought I looked. I don't. I didn't think I found it. But and, and there's several ways you can spell that. But to find your own last name encoded in one verse, <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that. Well, that's pretty neat. <laughs> but I wanted to show you that, brother Jonathan. It's cool. Very cool. Anybody else got something? I hope so. Does that mean you, you hope you got, what are you trying to say? I hope somebody's got something because oh. I accidentally came late. I'm, I've recorded this, so, um, and I'll, I'll put this deal. one on YouTube today. Um, I've been just kind of getting behind on getting them uploaded to, well, Discord now, but I do have them loaded and ready. All I got to do is transfer them over to the archive, guys. But this one, uh, it's been a good conversation today. I think it might be. Question. Yes. When- when doing a code specifically, like like for your name or you know, finding out, how do you know where to start from? Like, is there a specific like way to start, or a, like way you specific way you look for a book, or like how do you know where to start? And looking for your name, but first yeah. of all, just to see, just to see if if it's you know, and and having something that's a surname or something unique to you is is a big plus. But just simply starting with a search of, of your name or a surname or something related is is the first step to that. And then once you've got something, then you need to establish whether it, this has got you in it or not with, with the details, right? And okay. so, yeah, that's that's how I would I would go that way. Because um, I did look I did look for my name, but because it's Michael, it's so common. It's they every time I see it, it's the Archangel Michael, and I'm like, well, that's Archangel Michael. Again. Right. So you know, what does your wife? Does your wife have a have a t- nickname for you, or your mom had a nickname for you, or something? Something that makes it a little more personal, uh, and then we can narrow that broad field down to specific person, right? Okay. Um, right, Jonathan. Like, if you go and search out Jonathan Wright. Um, it is there, but that is a very general name. It's very plain, right? Like I said, I, I discovered there are four Jonathan Wrights in the same town that I'm in now. Um, so uh, could it be that all Jonathan Wrights are encoded on there? Yes, very possible. It could, because it, it will show 
all of it, I think, you, you, with the layering of, of random terms, the relevant terms have to be extracted for the individual, but it's there. If, if indeed the, if, if the concept is everyone under the name Michael Williams is under Michael Williams, then you're hidden in there somewhere in a sea of randomness as well, because that randomness don't apply to you. It may apply to another Michael Williams, right? Right. So extracting that surnames, getting it even to a smaller, narrower um, uh, um, pool of possibilities, if that makes any sense. Because when you're, when you're dealing with a big pool of thousands of possibilities, it's not very impressive. But when you get that pool down to, um, now we're talking about you know, incredible probability numbers because it's rare, that's where it's, it's more impressive to see, right? We don't want to see tables that are stretched out through many, you know, and you have huge gaps and, and your terms are all stretched out and you have to truncate because you can't get a full word in there. So you got to cheat a little bit. When you got to do all that, then, then there's, there's issues. But when so you, you want like a word cross all close together. Yeah. You want closest proximity and just like Micah's there, man, where we stacked on it. I mean, it's very, very easy to see, you know, you've got, Yosef in there and his his nickname and then right under that it's my son uh, or my excuse me my father uh, all these terms that seem to be kind of laying together right they're not they're not spread out they're all interacting they're maybe sharing letters that's when you know you've got a solid code going on okay you see that? Awesome. yeah thank you so I had a question about that table again um, over to the right it has wilderness mm -hmm. but the, the distance between the letters is like 10. That's fine. But, yeah. But like in the middle, it had a date, like directly in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know if that. That could all be relevant, brother. I mean, 10 is not a big skip. That's all in one line. But when you got 100,000 and it's at an angle like this, and, and so every five lines, you got to find a letter, and every five lines, and you know, that's spread out over a long area. But if you've got it all in one line, like it's it's just every other letter, every 10 letters, that's pretty impressive. Even if it is in the in the prior, uh, periphery of, of your access term, um, it could still be relevant, even though it doesn't have the proximity, like it's right on your name. It could still be relevant. Um, it, it's, it's all well, part of the I same matrix there. Can, yeah. can I share that one again? Yeah. Um, it's actually a little more than 10, but it's right here. I didn't know if it being that far oh, yeah, apart. That is, that is relevant, brother. It's all in one line. Okay. Yeah. And then that's supposed to mean. Uh, and that's pretty line. acceptable because that's line after line. It's, there's no, there's no huge gaps. We're not skipping down five and 10 lines. It's stacked line for line right there. And this is supposed to be the wilderness here. Uh, this is the date. Hey, Tom, sin. Yep. Hey. And Thank I you. think I used the dictionary on Keys to the Bible for this one because it says willow, uh, solo pompous, and wilderness is like the last. But that's right here. But the date, I had it backwards. The date is what I was. I was wondering about that since 2019, 2020. Yeah. But so you think there might still be some sure. significance? Sure. Yeah. They're definitely connected. Oh, uh, Willow, I don't know if you was here earlier, but I shared that table and it had my uh, son's name in it. Um, before he's born. We I remember. Born. Okay. Yeah. Is it a boy? Yeah. Yes, it is. No yeah. way. Yeah. How well, amazing. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations, too. How cool. Con con so his name is Congratulations. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming you're going to name him Yosef? Yep. And Aww. that's what I'm sharing the table for, you know. I mean, and Jonathan had an excellent table. I mean, that's everything's. Cool. You get to show out. him that. Yeah. How amazing. Yeah, if we have enough time. Right. I know. I, I thought the same thing when I said it. But still, <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. Print it yeah. out at least. 
Yeah, I love the details that the father has on. And it used to intrigue me when I read the scriptures as a little kid, and, and, he, and it says he knows that when every little sparrow falls out of the sky, well, imagine that or across the world, guys, at any given moment, some sparrow dropping it, and he knows this? And then he knows the hairs on your head. That's incredible detail that he knows about you. And then when you can see that reflected in the table that, that may have a connection to you, it, it solidifies that and uh, it actually strengthens your, your faith, I would think. That's what made me so passionate uh, in the later years of doing this about codes is, is he solidified my confidence in my uh, faith in what he's revealed to me that I know is no other way. Satan does not have access to this, guys. It, this is locked from him. And the reason that there are codes is to hide it from him for you. He didn't hide it from you. He hid it for you, <laughs> right? It, it's because, awesome, I think. Yeah, about, because the enemy wants to tear some. it up, and he wants to confuse you, and he wants to you know, pervert things. But the Father says, no, I'm going to seal some books, and it's only for them. The bots are things are for who? Our children and our children's children. This is talking about Israel. That's what it says. The bots are things, the, the unaccessible things. This is not just the hidden, the sowed or the zophon, the unaccessible, which means sealed. It's a sealed book. It's unaccessible. He says the, unaccep the unaccep unaccessible things are for you, my children. I believe that's, you know, a connection to the codes. And he sealed this for us. Um, for, I mean, the, imagine going treasure hunting. The joy of finding a nugget or a diamond. That's exactly what this is. It's like finding jewels and it's precious and it's, it's exciting and it's, uh, it, it's encouraging. Um, it's very powerful that he reveals something to you that you know in your heart because not everybody has access to a code program that you're quite possibly looking at something nobody in the world has ever seen until this moment. For 35, and it's from Yahuwah. And it's from the Father, exactly. Oh. Sealed for 3,500 years since the time of Moses till now. No one's ever seen it until, and that's a powerful moment, guys. I've gotten up and run and screaming, hallelujah, and just got so excited um, when, I, when, when we find something like a Yeshua code, and you just know nobody's ever seen this. Something comes over you. It's just like a joy and an amazement, like, you just revealed something to me nobody's ever seen. That's very special. That's like having a, a, a private conversation with the Most High, right? And yeah, exactly. Like, it's privy to that. <laughs> it's very precious when you get a hold of that and you realize that you're looking at something nobody in this world has ever seen because it's you just found it. It's, it's something about that. It's just like, thank you, Father, for bringing me to this point and revealing yourself. And I mean, tears are start. I mean, you start trembling uh, at at the, the the realization that something very special just happened. And and it's my prayer, guys, and my hope for you that every one of you experience that in some way in searching codes. That you'll have this experience with the ruach, where it's where the scriptures are true to you, where it says, "I will lead you." And you'll hear a little voice to say, go this way or go that way or search this term or search that term. Because I've had that happen to me, guys. In my sleep, I would hear terms and terminology I never heard before. And then I can't sleep. I have to get up and I'm compelled to go to the computer and see if it's there. And lo and behold, as he said, Hene yamin bain. behold, the days are coming. And you go and search that out. And, and it's a whole thing there on, on this. And it's like, you just opened something that nobody's ever seen. He just revealed this to you. You know he revealed it to you because you found it. He told you, you searched it, you found it, right? There's no question there's an involvement from the Holy Spirit. And so when I see PhDs coming on and trying to debunk the codes, I laugh at them. I laugh. This little old nobody didn't have 40 years of yeshiva. I didn't get to get a PhD in theology and Hebraic understanding. But this little old babe, like he says in the Gospels, Father, Yeshua says, Father, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the PhDs and the learning, but you gave it to the babies, the ones that don't know any, anything. 
you gave it to them. And so oh, I, man. when I see those videos or this guy come out, any of them, and they got all this education and they know better because they got the PhD and they've studied Semitic languages for 30 years. And duh, 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 duh. But yet, the PhD of the world. I just, I kind of chuckle and just think to myself, you have no idea. <laughs> no, man. You know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> That's right. You know nothing. You think you do because, uh, you know, Liberty University gave you a, right. a, a little piece of paper that says you know something. When it comes down to it, you don't know nothing. Doesn't it say in the scriptures that that the Father is the one that gives wisdom? Yes. That's that that exactly comes right. from him and not from men? That's right. Understanding? Right. Okay. I just had read that the other it day. It even so says in the end times that, that no man will need, you won't need your brother or your Amen. neighbor to teach you that the Holy Spirit will come and teach you. And matter of fact, that's where it says. Where, and it says everyone will know them from the least of them to the greatest of them will know Yahuwah. Exactly. No man will say teach Yahuwah, te know uh, Yahuwah for they all will know them. You know? Hallelujah. That's yeah. right. I love it. That's Me exactly too. right. And so that's what he's doing in this, uh, in this end time when he's bringing us out of all the nonsense, come out of her, my people. It's the Holy Spirit is saying, go this way, go that way. Don't go this so way. So you, you think that we, I, I just, I'm, I just keep wondering. And I know that um, Emily said it's because we're chosen, but I wonder like, why are we, a, why do we know now instead of uh, on the day of distress? You know what I mean? I mean yeah, timing is a is a lot is a big deal. Um, I think it's preparing us for that for the, the day of distress. There has to be somebody that has the wherewithal and the understanding and, and realization of what is happening. So, j just like it says in Daniel, that in that time there will be those that understand and will instruct many, and many will be saved. Man, oh. Many will survive because of those who know they're helping. So we're like getting prepared for battle. In exactly. A way he's preparing you right now. He's preparing okay. you. He's restoring you. He's putting his armor on you. Uh, he, he's, he's equipping you. All of that for the time that he's appointed. And, and, and it's, I think, times such as this, he says, where there are those that, that have this understanding and this and this. They will no longer murmur, but will learn doctrine. Yeah. I was searching for the words to say that. that that's in the words that, that uh, we were talking about, wasn't it? For those that had the love for him, the love to seek him, yeah. that want a deeper relationship with him and not just hear what man tells them. That's exactly right. Says yep, the eyes did. of the world searches. How said. ironic he said that, y'all. We were talking about the eyes of Yahuwah last night. I need to show yourself approved. Yeah. Amen. He is he's searching, searching, searching for those that are that are gonna listen or 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 hear his voice and understand. He's searching for those that are searching for him. Um and uh yeah. It's, it's, he tells it's, you in scripture to seek him out. Yeah. Yeah, we cannot be uh, those those kinds that that just show up on Sunday at a church and think that this this has got me covered. As long as I can get out of here by one and catch the NFL, well, <laughs> I'm covered. I'm covered Once in heaven. Know, yeah. So those kind of walks don't work, guys. It's shallow. It's nothing. It's it's a it's a charade. You're you're basically putting on a charade for those around you because intrinsically dealing with your own soul has no effect guys caution that's the as osas doctrine <laughs> yeah you you are not doing yourself any good just by going to church you're not getting brownie points for every time you put your butt on the pew and showing up it's a walk it's a relationship it's an obedient thing it's not just showing up right there is a little bit of work to it for those who say you can't be saved by the works well i'm sorry guys it does take some effort from you you have to pick up your Bible and, and, and take the step to try to find him. Once you make that step of coming to him, he will come to you. 
but you got to take it. You got to initiate. You got to pick up your Bible. You got to be searching him out for him to, to, to make himself known to you. Right. It's not sure says faith without works is dead. Yeah. And, and so many Christians twist that around. They, oh, you, well, you can't be, you're just trying to get into heaven by your works. No, my brother, I'm already in there. I'm oh, already in there. He's got me wrote down. It's I'm compelled in my heart because I love him that I want to obey my father. Oh, man. I want him to be happy. It's not about me working in, in my effort gets me into heaven. I'm already there by the bought and paid for sacrifice. My Messiah did. And all that's required of me is I believe, right? But I'm also compelled because I believe, because I love him. I want to walk this thing out. I want to walk like he did. You know, I'm showing my love to him out of my obedience. Exactly. It's a perfect balance of faith and works. Because right. didn't the Jews have a problem with uh, trying to stick strictly to the law? Yep. And yep. didn't have the faith? Yeah, and it's not even the law that, that's the Torah. Because by the time of Yeshua, we had already in the Talmudine era, where, where the Talmud is more precedent than the Torah. And this is exactly what Paul was. Paul was a Talmudine under Gamaliel. Those that wrote the, the Talmud, Gamaliel was one of the first sages that wrote. In the, had not Paul had his experience, Paul would have probably been an author in the Talmud. You would have been able to cite Paul in the Talmud, which is what? The oral law. This is the law that Yeshua came against. Yeah, I was going to say he came speaking against. Yeshua came speaking against the Torah. that law, not the Torah. Um, right? And the reason and how you know that is in every case where he's speaking against the law if you examine that it's a talmud talmudin law it's a yes. rabbinical law there's no when there nowhere in the scriptures that say that you got to wear your your seat seat down to the ground there's nowhere in the scriptures that say you got to wash your left hand first with a with a, a vessel and then wash your right hand with a vessel and all the time citing a prayer blessed is he creator of the universe who gave us this and that and we thank you oh father and none of that no that's rabbinical and so when Yeshua's disciples are eating without doing this, and, this, and these Pharisees are saying, see, you're not keeping the law. And he comes against it. He is not coming against the Torah, guys. He's coming against the stupid oral traditions of man. The, the right? washing of hands. What, the washing what, of ritualistic hands. Ritualistic washing of hands. It's, 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 not, it, it's not in the Torah. It's in the Talmud. Yes. Yeah. Nowhere does it say you have to put your left sock on before your right sock. And they do that today. Yeah. That is an oral Talmudine law that you, when you get out of the bed and you're putting your clothes on, it has to be in a sequence. You have to do the left foot first and the right foot. And it has to be the sock first and then the shoe and then the other foot sock first and then the shoe. If you got up in the morning and put on both socks and both shoes, you're in, the, you're in sin according to the Talmud. Dang you it. just broke the law. <laughs> yeah. And in modern times with lights on Shabbat, guess what? If you walk over and turn on the light, you just created fire. You just broke the law. That's the burden of the law that he's talking about, guys. There's nowhere in the, in the Torah that says you can't turn on the lights in Shabbat. That's man-made. And that's what Yeshua came against. He did not come against the law of the Torah, the instructions. And, and, and yet, yet Yeshua said, my burden is light. Yeah. I mean, what he's my... telling you was, he's telling you, you don't have to live under the, the Talmud, folks. These, these sages have stacked more on you than, you not, than you're supposed to have. It's a burden. Because as we have found out, Living Torah is not so much a burden, guys. It's actually freedom. It's freedom, and it's a lot of joy in it. It's fun. I haven't been burdened one time in, oh, man. under the Torah. I might have been frustrated when I realized it's Shabbat today and I can't go buy some whatever at the store, and I have to wait till sundown. Now it's a little frustrating. <laughs> it, it's not a burden, right? I just have to have to know what day it is, and and oh, I can't I cannot go money change today because it this is in the Torah, it, it is in the Torah that don't go spending money on the Shabbat, don't go buy and sell on Shabbat, and and 
you know, is that works? Is that trying to get into heaven from works? Not at all. It's being obedient to his Torah, right? Trying to get into trying to get into works, so to speak, under the law would be, you know, I'm going to do by the numbers. Before I eat my sandwich, I'm going to wash my hands and recite the prayer to, as per requested by the by the sages that this is the way. That's bringing myself under a burden. Yep. That is you, the you, of, of of these laws. That's it's not what when we just can distinguish these two and separate that then it becomes very clear. Oh my gosh, Paul actually kept the law. Paul was actually coming against his master, Gamliel. I mean, he was coming against the, what he was in and say, you know, wow. Yeah. He figured it out. And, but unless you understand Paul from that perspective and not from the hyper Paulism court that we see today, where that's all they study is Paul. And if you do that, what does Peter said? Peter say it's dangerous. If you don't understand Paul, it's dangerous to read Paul. Peter says that, folks. <laughs> it, it, even in ancient times, Paul was being misunderstood. And, and Peter warned them against this. He said, guys, listen, the writings of Paul are very deep. And unless you have an understanding, it's dangerous. You, you need to be careful with what you're reading in Paul out of context. That's a fact, Peter wrote. It, 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 it says that unstable and unlearned men twist his teachings and all other scriptures yeah. for their own own destruction. That's exactly what happens today. It, but but I, I have to I, I have to share with you. I got a small in, a, a little insight I, because Yeshua said, "If you love me, keep my commandments." And it's out of love that we keep his commandments. Right. Exactly right. Then, then when, when you have that genuine right. conversion and, and that genuine walk with Yeshua, because of love, because you love him, you want to be obedient. You know, when a man and woman gets married, because I love Darla, I want to never commit adultery. Right. I don't want to ever break any, any, anything between us because I love it's out of love. It's not because I, I'm, I feel, you know, I have to work this marriage. It has it's work. It's a, it's a, it's a job. It's something that's, you know, it's oppressive or something. No, it's love keeps me from looking at any other woman and, and desiring her love keeps me engaged in this marriage. I want to walk righteous because I love her. You know, it's the same thing with our father. Once we come into Torah and we realize that, oh, wow, the gospel is actually the fulfillment of what the prophets said and the promises they made about this Messiah. And wow, all the disciples are keeping Torah. Even Paul was keeping Torah. I have to consider maybe I was taught wrong. Maybe my understanding was wrong. I'm missing something. I want to know the truth. And you start running that thing down and then you, you, you're at a point where I just want to love you, Father. I just want to be obedience to you. It's not about work like I, I haven't, you know, salvation isn't enough. That is not even in the mindset when, when, when you're at that point. You know, maybe earlier, maybe early, if you're just coming out of sin, you're just coming out of, maybe you, you feel compelled. I got to do something to, to prove that I love him. Like you have to prove yourself. That is very possible. You could probably be such a young Christian and not know any better that you feel like you have to do something to prove you love him. But I believe eventually you'll come to a point where you, you understand our father loves us anyway. His mercy that was shown to me that I could come to, to the knowledge of him out of, was love. And so the natural response is not, well, I got to do something to earn his love. No, it's not about that. He already loves me. He already saved me. Now it's my turn to show that I love him. How do I do that? Do I just keep, you know, walking on through life and never say a word to him, never pray, never say, thank you, Father, or nothing, never acknowledging? That's not love. You know, when you want a son and daughter, or you got this parent relationship, an exchange of love, and have gone going 
I don't much do it with my sons because, you know, they're kind of grown boys. They're probably kind of like this. But my daughter, she's still at an age where I can hug her. And, you know, when she's sleeping, I'll go kiss her on the, on the forehead and, and I'll say, I love you. And it's a, it's a, that genuine kind of, it's not because I'm trying to earn her love. I love her. I want to protect her. I protect all my sons, all my kids. But that, but that showing the affection is just a natural thing, right? And it, that's what happens in your walk. You want to, it just comes naturally to want to be obedient and, and to loving and to show that in, in your walk. It's just natural. It's not, it's, we're trying to earn our way into heaven, guys. Every one of you know you're saved, right? It's just that, that, motion of walking it out in love just just natural to me that's that's the explanation i kept you another 38 minutes <laughs> i love it all right so I'm, I'm gonna close it here i'll get this uploaded uh, let me bless you guys unless there's anything you, you guys want to share um i got some stuff to go handle before the end of the day good great class i love the engagement from you guys it's only been what seven of us the whole time wow wonder where everybody is anyway let me pray for you and we'll we'll see you guys in the next class and i'll probably put this one on youtube if it, everybody's okay with that yes sir